Welcome to the Automators Podcast with your host, Jackie Stook and Joe Glines. Hey, so today we're going to talk about why we think your script has to do more than just be a better mousetrap. Awesome, let's do it. Hey, everybody, it's Jackie here from Copenhagen. And Joe from Dallas, Texas. Yeah, so today we're going to talk about um, what we called your script has to be more than a better mousetrap. And the reason we're saying it this way is that um, we think that it's great to have a script or an idea for a script, or if you have made a beta version of someone else's uh, script or program or automation, but that's often not enough. Yeah, absolutely. Right. I mean, the very first thing you have to understand is people aren't going to, it's one of those things I run into a lot because I work more in marketing than programming. And people often think if I only do the best X, if I'm the best restaurant, you know, maker, uh, chef, if I'm the best closet maker, if I'm the best painter, people are going to beat down the path to me, right? If I'm the best, if I write the best uh, image search and click thing, people are going to beat down the path to my door and I'm good to go, right? And it's almost never the case, right? It's it's so rare, you know, that that actually hands out, you know, plays out. So one of the very first things I always tell, ask people when, when they say this is say, what's your unique selling proposition, right? What is it about that, what you're developing, you know, or your, your tools, your script, your whatever it is you're offering, what makes it unique? Why should someone buy your thing instead of buying someone else's thing or not even buying anything at all, right? What identifying that is by far, the most critical thing you can work on. Yeah, yeah. And one of the ones we've talked about many times over is also trying to find the ideal uh, buying persona, right? Who's going to buy it, right? They're, because they're not just going to buy it because you tell them to, right? It, if you have a great selling proposition uh, where you can actually point out why your product is better or your script or your program is better, uh, you still need to figure out who to tell that to. So um, that that's also a great one to have in mind. And I know from experience that if you actually can hit that, if you can figure out some way to target pretty specifically on people who truly would have an interest in your uh, program, it can work wonders, really. And... You can, and I've done it with Joe, test and uh, A and B test. You can do all kinds of stuff. If you just have a target, you can figure out your unique selling proposition uh, along the way, and you can test upon it to actually figure out if you have the right one. Uh, as long as you have a good, solid target to uh, send those tests to. That, that that really does work great. So I'd say marketing in general is probably almost more important than the actual program. It's actually, it's a little sad to me, but um, honestly, I 100% I believe that that is absolutely true. And and to follow up on your point, Jackie, of the, the whole, how are you going to actually identify them? That's one of the, you know, like Dan Kennedy talks about, I think it's a, a a three, you know, a, um, like a diamond. There's the the message you're going to use to communicate to them, which has to do with your unique selling proposition. It's identifying your customers, right? And then the medium you're going to use to reach them, right? And that's where if you can find, it's usually like an affiliate kind of thing, not affiliate the way we think of it. It's affiliation, right? How people identify themselves around this product or whatever it is you're selling. That's often a great way, like let's say Facebook groups, Right. Or the fact they've installed a certain app or that they've they go on LinkedIn, they have a job title. Right. There, there's dozens and dozens and hundreds and hundreds. And there's um, there's demographics, corporate graphics, there's uh, attitudinal type things. Right. Of like I'm a certain age group and I have certain behaviors type of things. All these things are crazily available that you can buy when you say I want to get a list of X people. Right. I want to get a list of people who've done X, Y, and Z. And the more tailored you are, as the saying goes, there's riches and niches, right? The more focused you are and the more you can tailor it down, the better, even though it costs you more per person, 
your 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 advertising and communications and marketing will be so much more effective because you're reaching the right audience. And often what you might do is say, let's say actually, let's say males and females are both your target audience, but they have very different reasons um, as to how they act on something, right? That's where you would have a different message for each of those and reach them, target them with different ads, right? And maybe someday we should consider doing some stuff just to demonstrate on like Facebook advertising because you and I both have done a lot of stuff. It's it's so complicated, right, Jackie? I mean, it's, it, we've it spent hours. Um, it's amazing what you can do, but it is, it is I think, by far one of the most critical things that you can do is make sure you can in some way identify that target market. Yeah, yeah. I, I've been amazingly lucky, uh, at least in a few cases, where the target market almost presented itself, uh, either by people having pre-joined uh, some way to target them or uh, uh, other ways in like that. And if your product is specific enough, you can target just as specifically to them. Uh, so, so if... It's it's the same that's often seen if you have a local business. Doesn't really make much sense to put uh, your article in um, a global newspaper, right? It it makes much more sense, both price wise, but also the people actually seeing it. If you put it in a local paper, just as a simple thing. And if you do the same, if you have Facebook advertising go with something that's geographically uh, narrow. Or if you use Google, make sure that the words that you're targeting actually are as close to what your product actually does, because it simply doesn't make sense to say, oh, I have hunting knives, so I will just hit everybody who searches for knife. Right? What? It's just too wide so yeah yeah absolutely no yeah that's it's a great point jackie and I, I don't remember her name but it's a great book from dan kennedy and um the lady who i can't remember her name she was a madam in new york so she ran like a brothel basically and this was a really well published thing 25 years ago somewhere in there and she actually unlike all of her competitors who were running things in these really filthy um, magazines, right, of the escort service stuff. She did stuff like in the Financial Times and maybe the New York Times or, or no, there's um, Wall Street or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. And it was because she said, okay, who is my target audience? It's really, you know, very wealthy people, especially from out from other countries that come in and do this and that. So the, the thing that Dan Kennedy often says is, you know, go get in front of your prospects, your potential customers, especially if you can do it where none of your competitors are, right? Go somewhere, be somewhere where and you're going to be in front of them where your competitors aren't. And it's so much easier to stand out, right? And that's what she did. And just, she had an amazing business until finally at some point, you know, someone blew the, excuse the term, um, blew the lid on the operation. But um, it was, I actually read through the whole book. It was really interesting as, as far as that goes. Yeah, I'd, I'd say I've, I've had luck with, with that one as well, with uh, Facebook marketing. Um, my competitors weren't marketing on Facebook, but as, as me and Joe figure out, there was a great targeting opportunity there and we could target lots and lots of customers who were probably using a competitor's tool, uh, and, and simply just swap customers or whatever you would call that. Go in and, and tell them some of the great stuff that my program was offering uh, that I already knew from researching my competitors that they weren't. Right. Uh, so thereby getting people who were already shown to have opted in to uh, you being a user a category um, user right yeah, absolutely absolutely and that yeah. that worked great really well, I was gonna say, generally speaking um that's where if you want to if you already have a business going and you want to get more more sales by far by absolute far the easiest way to make more money is to target your current customers and get more money from them right 
The second best way is to find your competitor's customers and target them because, to your point, Jackie, they're category users. They're already buying. Spending money is one of the most important parts. Not that they don't buy the don't go after ones that have free stuff because you don't even want those. They're annoying, right? You actually want to discourage those guys. But you know, find ones that are already paying someone else. And boy, it's so much easier to get money from them than a random person, right? So uh, yeah, really great points, Jackie. And actually, I, I don't know how much you want to let on of, do you want to talk about our, our stents into YouTube <laughs> um, with the targeting there? That yeah, yeah. It, I, again, I, I love that we had a lot of experience from Facebook and the way that the Facebook algorithm used your budget and stuff like that, whereas... Uh, we tried our luck with uh, YouTube as well, and they don't target the same way. They use, like Google does, uh, keywords. And we put in, at the time, the marketing pro uh, budget was fairly large compared to the company's overall intake of people. So we were probably um, round-handed or whatever you would call it with setting the budget for the ad. And apparently nobody else was uh, <laughs> trying to advertise for this keyword. So the budget we set was uh, depleted within a few hours. And that meant that everybody actually saw the ad, which would normally have been good. But as the company that uh, actually was behind the stuff that was being automated really didn't like um, that, uh, it, it gave quite a big uproar in the community and had um, an effective backlash, might be a way of putting it. Uh, again, the actual advertising went very well because we actually hit the target audience amazingly well. Sadly, it, it didn't pan out as we had hoped. Um, and again, with more experience, we could probably have set the bar for the budget uh, up in a different way, and it might have worked. Well, and change the message as well, right? Yeah. Like up to exactly. have, have it slightly different. Uh, but also, which I don't think you mentioned was, you know, you can say, hey, let me go find my competitors' videos. And for those that are monetized, and I don't know if it's changed since then, you can say, I want to do an ad on those videos, right? Yeah. So this is where it's crazy amazing. You can find if you have a competitor out there that's already doing something sort of similar. Or back to the point earlier, which this is where I want to go next, is even if it's not a competitor, but you know the target audience, it's going to be a huge overlap, right? That's where you say, hey, I want to target people that are there. And what, at least in sometimes your ad will get shown possibly even before when they click the thing to watch the video, yours is shown first. And so people actually think they're watching the video they clicked on, right? And it's it's just, it's really amazing like that you can do this. You, um, you will see the same thing on Google results. People have probably gotten very, very used to it. Uh, back in the day when Google didn't have ads, we loved Google even more and that's probably why it got so big. Um, right. Then right. they were as big as they wanted to be and now they have ads, and that means that you can actually pay for a placement on the front page. And I see quite a few um, not as uh, ad, not as well virtual computer users just seeing the results, clicking an ad if they think that's the thing. Whereas I, as a principal, and I don't know why, I'll gladly scroll down eight results to get below the ads and take the first pick there. But again, it works. The ad is there. You get in front of people who have searched for something that makes sense for you. I've used that as well. It works quite well. And I could jump ahead of competitors who had been on market for quite a few years, more longer than me. And my analytics showed that it worked. I had quite a good boost of people coming in from Google that way. Yeah. And actually what in that case, what you might do also is if you specifically know you're, you're borrowing someone else's audience that they're a competitor, 
that's when the message would really be hard hitting. Hey, this guy, Paul, he's the one that we're going against. Paul's tool doesn't do this, right? This is the message for this video we're going to tie it to. And so people watching it that are going that were like, oh, well, crap, this other one does this stuff that that doesn't do. Okay. Um, now, where I was going to go a little bit before there was the, um, you can find other things that aren't necessarily your direct competitors. And because the problem, of course, is if you contact a direct competitor and say, hey, can I, can I borrow your list? They're going to, you know, they're going to, they're going to say no, right? Um, they're, they're not going to be too happy with you. But hey, what if you could find someone, let's say we, we, we did pizzas, right? And we're in a small town, but there's another, let's say, restaurant here that does Mexican food, right? Do they compete? Well, they both serve food, but you know what? On a given night? No, not really. So why don't you go to them and say, hey, why don't we swap? Why don't I include something in my newsletter or an email or on my Facebook page and you do it for me and we're going to cross, you know, borrow each other's lists, which is another really important thing, which obviously if you've, you're, you know, on my newsletter, you understand, like I'm up to 5,500, I think, email addresses roughly somewhere in there. Of, of people now having a newsletter, having an email address and a newsletter, a way to reach out. It's a critical way to be able to stay in front of your, your prospects and your customers. Um, it's such a great, you know, a lot of people will do just like a Facebook type thing and, oh, I posted there, but that only works if they go there, right? Or that they do a Google search. And if they're not doing that, you have no way to reach out to them with an email or maybe even a text, you know, phone number. You can get in front of them when you want to. Back when, when I was blogging, I I got and I reached out uh, to to other bloggers in um, that general area. It might be IT related or tech related or camera related or whatever your thing was. And if other people were having hobby blogs or whatever yeah, it was, Offer to do an article uh, that uh, right. targets their uh, immediate uh, subject uh, with your words, whatever it might be, your take on it. Uh, let's say you were an avid um, amusement park visitor. Yeah, okay, give your take on it. If you're someone who has, I don't know, lighting equipment, Give your take on camera equipment that works great with it. Whatever it might be, you you know what I say. The general idea of just swapping. So you might offer them a place and an article with their name, with links to their stuff, and you would do the same with them. So you are trying to swap customers. Well, I, I can actually you know give you an example just recently, uh, but I've been doing it for years, right? With Hellbent and I will will do videos. We both have YouTube channels. His, I finally surpassed him as number of subscribers, but it was pretty close for a long time. And uh, we we would do joint videos together because we didn't care, right? And we're like, hey, you know what? I'll get in front of your audience. You get in front of mine. This is awesome because he mostly works with like either GDI or GUIs. We don't have a quote unquote competition. And even then, there's just not that many YouTube channels out there. So who who cares, right? Uh, but like recently, what's awesome is I've been reaching out to like Spanova. I did a video with him last week, uh, and I've done some, you know, several things with Tab Nation and that. The thing I love about it, Jackie, is you're gonna you, you laugh. Is like I can be lazy. I don't have to go write new stuff and new things. I interview them. They come on my channel. I get content that my users are gonna like. They get exposure to my audience, which which is again, it's a win win, right? So like I love this because. It's just less work that I have to do, right? And everyone wins. Yeah, we have mentioned Pat Flynn a few times, or uh, we have at least personally talked about him a few times. And he does exactly that. He's been doing it for years. He's sitting at it in his studio, wherever. He has a topic, and he has, um, let's call it an expert. That as expert has his audience, that likes to hear what he has to say. And Pat Flynn has his. And by doing that um, two, three times a week, taking someone in, he has now built, and that's probably years ago, but a multi-million dollar uh, enterprise by simply just continuously pulling people into his show. They want to get access to his subscribers. They want to have their opinions known or their expertise out there, stuff like that. 
And he's okay. just building his community like crazy. I just say, look at Joe Rogan, right? He, he's, yeah. he, if I know right, he's the largest podcaster, but um, it, you know, it's crazy the audience he gets. And it's usually, he's just talking to the people he comes in, right? And it's, it's awesome. Now, uh, for me, at least, I want to think, bring up one last thing. And, and Facebook is the one that at least first to me made it, made it simp- really simple and easy to do. Although you can do the exact same thing with LinkedIn. And actually, I think now with Reddit as well, have the pixel, right, installed on a website. And so when you're, when you're doing some sort of, either if you're not doing advertising, whatever you're doing, draw people to, you have a website to start. Okay. Draw people to your website. Um, that those often, if you're paying for it or not, it'll it'll bring people to your website. But what's amazing is if you have like the Facebook pixel or LinkedIn or Reddit pixels on your website, after they visited once, you can target them again for very, 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 very inexpensively, right? It cuts the cost so far down, it's crazy. And the vast majority of people don't realize that you can do this, but it's so simple. It's so simple. It is. And and also also just for the numbers. Just so you can actually see sure. if your yep. advertising is working. Just that's one of the metrics that yep. we looked at. At one point, we were uh, having so good numbers that there was no reason to look at anything but what am I paying? What's the price per buy in? Right. And we could target exactly on that. So, oh, this ad isn't doing well enough to. Um, the the cost of of of, of buy right and the, so so yeah, it's a numbers keeping, game yeah keeping track of of that just makes a lot of sense and actually what's really cool on on the Facebook one actually now I don't know because sorry I meant to say LinkedIn Facebook used to have audience insights I think it's still there but because of all the privacy stuff I think it's at the bare, you know, best, it's not nearly as valuable as it used to be. It used to be incredible. Now it's, I think, okay, right? It's good. Yeah. But the LinkedIn one, I can, I can see who visits my websites. I can see their job titles. I can see what companies are coming from, where geographically they're coming from, right? Specifically, so it's, it's really fascinating that you can do that. And I had one more. Okay, um, I'm just thinking out uh, there's there's still a lot you can do but i'd still just emphasize that having the idea or having the script or having already made the automation that's a great starting point um and then trying to figure out your audience that's that's the next part of it um or at least having what makes your tool something that people would want right your your selling proposition because that can be really hard you can be very happy about it it can make leaps and bounds of uh, difference to you and you think nobody can live without it but if you actually try to be um, uh, unbiased or whatever you'd call that uh, towards and trying to figure out what would make other people buy it that that can be hard figuring out what really truly interests a customer, it, and it can really surprise you as well. So a, a really good example uh, that Dan Kennedy often cites is uh, Domino's Pizza. Like they basically said, "We're going to get you fresh pizza fast." They they didn't even say good. They just said like in thirty minutes or less, or your money back, or it's free, or something, right? Um, that was all they did, and they blew the competition away for so many years and grew like crazy. Uh, it was it was really astounding. Of like, most people were all about quality or this or that, and it was just like we're going to get it to you right away, and it, and it will be fresh, right? We didn't say it was good, but it was just a, a really interesting way that they realized for their market, which was basically stoned college and high school kids, is what they said. That that's what they were going after. Um, it worked really well. Now, the last one I want to mention, or did you have something on that, Jackie? No, I'm I'm just like, here where I live, I would love to have a me- metrics like that. Oh, yeah. I can choose the ones that will have it at my door within 30 minutes. Right. Uh, right. We don't have that. 
Yeah. Um, now, the last one I want to mention in passing, maybe we'll do a podcast on this because it's a it's complex, uh, but it's it's a very very important one to understand is split sample testing. And so Jackie several times mentioned Google and Google AdWords is a great one just to say, hey, I'm trying to understand what words you know or even images or whatever, and that's where like Facebook ads and everything. You do look up A/B testing or split sample testing and understand for very little money. And that was what Jackie, when he was doing his, you know, really spending time in his bot, he didn't because he was doing everything. I said, well, why don't I have some fun and I'll I'll do some testing, right? And so um, we tested different messages and I would write them out. And then Facebook has like automatically random. The problem is it's so crazy complicated. You know, there were there were like. So complicated, but it would automatically rotate the message or the image and tell you, hey, this combination of this picture with this title and this body, this is what had the highest conversion rate. So not only click through rate, but actually sales, right? Because yeah. we were we had that tracked. Um, fascinating, fascinating stuff. If you can get it down to that, I can guarantee you, you can you can be successful. You should be able to be successful because it's just a numbers game. Then, right? You tweak it and keep tweaking and, and learn from it. Absolutely. So let us know if you want us to follow up and dive deeper into some of these topics. We kind of glossed over them. I mean, there's a lot of a lot of different stuff we could talk to on different podcasts on each one. I, I'm just not sure if everyone wants to get into it, but it is. We all want to think, hey, I'm going to build a script and I'm going to sell it and I'm going to get rich. And you're like, yeah, <laughs> it's just there's a lot more work. Yeah, truly. I, I, I don't know how many scripts and programs and things I automated and ideas I thought I had, but actually getting people to buy into it, that was a whole other oh, thing. Yeah. I, I do have one final last tip, which I think Jackie's going to first laugh, but he will wholeheartedly agree. Whatever you do, don't try to sell to the auto hotkey audience <laughs> <laughs> for, for, for various reasons. What is their, you know, we, we, cause we we're we're doers ourselves, right? Like we're just going to write it. So we don't even want to buy something, but we're also cheap. And we also don't, we think some think it should be free. So get that out of your head right away. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks. Cheers. Yeah. Bye. Bye.